we're all set. Okay. Yeah, thank you for being with us this afternoon. Uh, today is the second in a series of four presentations on the life and legacy of Abraham Lincoln. Today's speaker is David Kent. He is the president of the Lincoln Group of the District of Columbia and the author of several biographies, including one on Abraham Lincoln. Uh, David, we are looking forward to your presentation. Uh, take it away. Thanks, John. Um, so welcome everybody who's here. And as everybody knows, Lincoln was a politician and uh, he was also a lawyer, um, uh, but we're not gonna talk much about him being in, in the law, maybe a little. Uh, so we're gonna focus on Lincoln the politician because that really was his passion. So let's, let's get started by going through a series of bullet points. And I'm gonna spend a little bit of time on this, uh, this slide, not because I like bullet points, but it'll, uh, it'll give me an idea, you'll give an idea by the time we're finished, his whole political career. So we'll start with when did he first get involved in politics? When was his first political speech? And that was really in 1830. And if you remember from Ed's talk last week, uh, Lincoln was only 21 years old in 1830. His family had just moved from Indiana to uh, uh, from Indiana to Illinois, you know, living out just outside of Decatur. And he goes and he listens to Peter Cartwright, who was a Methodist minister, uh, recurring political rival over the, over Lincoln's career, as it turns out. And he gives a speech, and Lincoln listens to it, and he says, "You know, I don't." I, I object to some of these doctrines that Cartwright is laying down. They're just a little bit too dogmatic. So he's encouraged to get up and give a rebuttal. And effectively he gets, gives what is, uh, what would become the Whig, Whig report, rebuttal and the Whig philosophy, um, even though the Whig party didn't officially uh, start at that point. But he did pretty well and he really gets the bug for, uh, for politics. So two years later, he runs for the Illinois State Legislature. Now, he hasn't learned to write short yet. So he writes a very, very long letter of introduction. It gets published in the Sangamo Journal. And in it, he spends a lot of time talking about something I'm going to talk about in a little bit, internal improvements. And then maybe a third of it, he talks about education and other issues. But immediately after publishing this, he, just, he joins with many, many other people. Um, volunteers to go fight in the Black Hawk War. So he immediately goes and he gets elected as captain uh, of his company and serves as captain for about a month. He doesn't really know what he's doing, which I'll talk about next week. But he, he gets there and, he, and he, his term is up after a month. So he reenlists for another month as a private and then reenlists for a third month as a private. And by the time he gets back to New Salem, where is the, he's living now, um, it's really just shortly before the election, and he loses. Uh, he loses because he, he knows people in the New Salem area, but he hasn't really gotten people to know him outside of that. So he does win 277 votes out of the 300 that were cast in New Salem, but he, he loses the election because nobody else knows who he is. So two years later, he decides, I'm going to run again. Uh, this time he has a little bit more experience. He knows people outside because he's been a store clerk. He's 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 uh, been uh, he's worked as a, um, a postmaster, so he's out there meeting more people. And he does get elected to the Illinois State Legislature. Then he's reelected in 1836 and in 1838 and 1840. So he spends a total of four terms and eight years in the Illinois State Legislature. Now I'm going to talk more about his Illinois State Legislature legislature time uh, in a minute. So in 1846, he gets elected to the U.S. House of Representatives to Congress. So there's a little bit of a backstory to this, because when he got out of the Illinois State Legislature in 1842, when his last term ended, he wanted to run for Congress. But <clears throat> this area that he lived in was about the only place in Illinois that you get a Whig elected to uh, to elected to the U.S. Congress, so and there were there were some rivals. So they they debated and they discussed it and they came up with this kind of a gentleman's job sharing agreement. So Edward Baker, who was a friend of Lincoln, and who in fact Lincoln named his second son Eddie after, 
He runs as a Whig and he gets elected and he serves a term in Congress. Two years later, John Hardin runs, it's his turn. He runs, he gets elected to Congress. And the third time around, it's Lincoln's turn. Now by this time, this idea of the gentleman's job sharing agreement has sort of gotten lost in the, in the weeds. And he had to fight his own people in the Whigs to say, you know, wait a second, it's my turn, you know, fair is fair. So he does get the nomination, he does get elected, and um, he serves as one term in the House of Representatives. He does not run for re-election, in part because of this job sharing agreement, but also in part uh, because of some things he says that maybe would have made re-election more difficult. Um, I'll talk about that uh, again in a minute. So when he gets out of Congress in 1849, through the late 1860, when he's elected president, he is not in any kind of political office. Uh, that doesn't mean he's out of politics. And some people say, well, he's out of politics. He's just doing, he's just being a lawyer, which isn't really true. He was still involved in politics, but he was campaigning for others. He campaigned, uh, he, he debated uh, Stephen A. Douglas a few times for other people, and he gave political speeches. He also was building his uh, political capital and building his network. There were also a lot of other things that happened during that decade or so that he was out of political office, that all of which had some major factor, played a major factor in both Lincoln's uh, uh, political career and the political career of the country. So let's talk about some of these. In 1850, there's the Compromise of 1850. So the great compromiser, Henry Clay, who had been the main uh, party who came up with the compromises in 1820 called the Missouri Compromise, um, along with John C. Calhoun and Daniel Webster, um, he was pushing through this big omnibus bill in 1850. But by this time, uh, you know, Clay was getting old. He didn't have the political capital he had before. He didn't have the energy and he would die a couple of years later. So he wasn't able to get through this big omnibus bill. So in steps, the new guy in the block that's gaining in strength and power, but for the Democrats, Stephen A. Douglas. And Douglas um, manages to work out so that they can get these five different bills passed. And the five bills together are, are this compromise of 1850. So the five bills are first Texas, uh, it refines Texas's borders. Remember the Tex Texas had, fought against Mexico to break away from Mexico because the Texians wanted to maintain slavery and Mexico said, no way, you, know, you can't have slavery. So they broke away from Mexico, then they were annexed by the, United, by the United States. And then after the Mexican War, which was 1847, 48, that time period, um, they became a state. And this, their, their state was much, much bigger than it is today, encompassed a lot of the surrounding areas. So this re refined their borders. The Compromise of 1850 also got rid of the slave trade in the District of Columbia. Not slavery, but the slave trade. Lincoln had famously said that, you know, he could look out the window of a Capitol building and see people being bought and sold right there in the, in, the, in the shadow of the Capitol. So this would end the, the slave trade in the District of Columbia. <clears throat> it also uh, admitted California as a free state. The first time when you had a free state without having a concurrent slave state because the, the slave powers had really made sure, which the slave powers had controlled Congress and the presidency up till Lincoln's time. So they were able to make sure that the, 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 the free states didn't get too, many, too much power. So California comes in and they decide, they can't really decide on Utah and the Mexico territories, which are much bigger than current Utah and Mexico states. So they say, well, we'll, we'll make that so that they can decide for themselves whether they'll be slave or free. And if that sounds familiar, because that's basically popular sovereignty, which I'll talk about next. The big piece of the Compromise of 1850 though was the Fugitive Slave Act. Um, the original con in the constitution, there's a fugitive slave clause that says any escaped slaves have to be returned, but there wasn't really any mechanism for doing that. There was no teeth in it and not much happened. And Congress tried a couple of times to, to give it more bite, but they weren't able to do it. But in the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850, 
the federal government now became slave catching organization. They were required to track down and return escaped enslaved people. Worse, citizens in free states were required to assist. And if they refused to assist, they could be fined. Or worse, they could be sent in prison. And certainly if you were caught helping escape, uh, uh, slaves escape, then you could definitely lose everything. So there was a, it was a very, very difficult um, a bill. Nobody really liked it. This whole idea was supposed to you know, end the slave problem and it just made it worse. I'll talk about uh, some of this later. Uh, in 1854, the Kansas-Nebraska Act is passed, pushed through by Stephen A. Douglas. And this is the act that aroused Lincoln like never before, he tells us because Lincoln listened to this and he said, you know, this is this popular sovereignty. And Douglas said, you know, the states can decide for themselves, the territories can decide for themselves whether or not they will be free or slave. In Kansas, Nebraska, we're talking about the territories of Kansas, Nebraska, not the states. So effectively, all of the, uh, all of the Louisiana Purchase, uh, northern part of the Louisiana Purchase states, which had the Missouri Compromise of 1820 had, had said would be free. Now that's not the case. Now they can all be slave if, if they so chose, as could all of that, uh, all the territories grabbed from the Mexican War. So this is what got Lincoln really back into politics. He said, I'm not just gonna stump for other people. I need to be in the ring. I need to be dealing with this. So the following year, he runs for Senate. Now. As I remember, the senators, con con senators for U.S. Congress were picked by the state legislatures, not by the popular vote like they are now. So Lincoln is in the state legislature. He actually is way ahead in the first ballot. He's not that far from, from getting a majority. Uh, in fact, if Lyman Trumbull, who was an anti-Nebraska uh, Democrat, would um, would have given his five votes to Lincoln, you know, he would have he would have won. But that didn't happen. He was running also against um, James Shields, who some people rec recognize that name. Uh, Lincoln almost had a duel with James Shields years before. Well, Shields, as he was definitely a Kansas Nebraska Act um, Democrat, and he was, you know, he was objectionable to the Whigs and and the, and the nation Republicans, but he you know, he wasn't as bad as, as some of the others. But then they pulled a little bit of a switcheroo after about three ballots, Lincoln's not gaining any, any votes. Uh, and they decide that the Democrats decide that they're gonna switch out, um, they're gonna switch out Shields for, for Joel Madison, who was definitely objectionable to the, to the Whigs and Republicans and a lot of other Democrats. So in the end, it went about nine, nine or 10, I forget, number of, uh, of ballots. And Lincoln was losing ground as it went along. So he said, told his people, go vote for Trumbull because Trumbull is, 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 is a good guy. He's a friend. Um, he's not gonna be so bad as Madison is. So Trumbull ends up winning the Senate race even though Lincoln was way, way ahead of him to begin with. And Trumbull, like Lincoln, becomes a Republican. Uh, this actually, by this time, Lincoln was starting to make a name for himself. People say, you know, that by the time of his uh, presidential election, nobody knew who he was. That's not entirely true. Uh, the year following this Senate run, he actually had made himself a name enough in the, in the parties that he was given 110 votes for vice president when the Republicans uh, filed their, sent their first uh, candidate for president. That was uh, John C. Fremont. And um, that was not the first place. Uh, Lincoln came in second and, and Dayton ended up being a running mate with, with Fremont um, and they lost anyway. Um, but, but he was starting to get some national recognition. So one more thing happens that affects Lincoln's political career. In 1857, there's a Dred Scott decision. Dred Scott, I'm sure everybody on this call knows, was um, uh, an enslaved man in, held in Missouri, which is a slave state. 
But then he was taken to Illinois, which is a free state and the free territory of Wisconsin. After, and he, where, while he's there, he gets married, he has kids. And then uh, through some various reasons, he gets brought back to Missouri. And he says, wait a second, I've been in Illinois and Wisconsin territory for such a long time. And it was years that I should be free. And he sues and he actually wins at first. Um, but then it gets to the state Supreme Court and up to the uh, U.S. Supreme Court, where Chief Justice Roger Taney, who's a Maryland slave owner, um, leads the seven to two decision that says, I'm sorry, but Dred Scott, uh, you're still enslaved. You know, once a slave, always a slave. And then, in fact, he said, well, you know, anybody who's black has no rights for which a white man is bound to respect. You can't even be a, you can't even be a citizen. And therefore, you have no standing to even sue. And if that's not bad enough, uh, Tony goes on, and he's really like forgetting all of certain precedents and everything, but he goes on and says, Congress has no right to ban slavery in any of the territories. This despite the fact that Congress has done just that several times. I mean, there's a Northwest Ordinance so that, that banned slavery in the territories that be later became Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, Michigan, uh, Wisconsin. It, it, it had the Missouri Compromise of 1820 that banned slavery in the northern part of the uh, of the uh, Louisiana Purchase. So they certainly had banned slavery, but he says you can't do that. And that becomes very, very important when uh, Lincoln runs for Senate the following year against uh, um, Stephen A. Douglas. I'm going to talk more about Stephen A. Douglas and, and the Senate run uh, in a little bit, so I'm not going to talk much about that now. And then in 1860, he's elected president. So again, I'm going to talk about that in, uh, in a little bit. So let's, let's go back a little bit and talk about Lincoln's time in the Illinois State Legislature. There are three main issues that he has to deal with in the Illinois state legislature. And these three issues can reflect national trends and issues. So they are the transfer of the state capital to Springfield, uh, internal improvements and slavery and what I'm calling anti-abolitionism. So let's talk about the first one, you know, the, the moving the state capital. Uh, state capital originally in Illinois when it became a state in 1818, which is only two years after Indiana became a state and the Lincolns moved from Kentucky to Indiana. Here's Kentucky in the bottom. Missouri still was not a state yet in 1818 and Iowa was, was territory. All of the population was in the Southern part of Illinois. So they said, okay, let's put Kaskaskia as our state capital. Kaskaskia is a strange place, not mentioned because of its name, but it sits on this tongue of land that actually is on the western side of the Mississippi River, which is the whole border with Illinois along here is the Mississippi River. So it sticks out into what is now Missouri, which was prone to flooding. Um, the state house at the time, which was really just a hotel that was used, uh, that is long, long gone. And there was a lot of flooding in the area. So it was not the best place for, for a capital to begin with. But when Missouri became a state in 1820 in the Missouri Compromise, having uh, the state capital of Illinois sticking out onto the western side into the Missouri side of the Mississippi River didn't make a whole lot of sense. And by that time, population had grown. So they moved it inland and north. That's because all of this growth in Indiana, Ohio, Illinois, most of it came from the south moving up. And that was, that was common. So you had people both who were, who were slave owners and wanted and were okay with slavery. And you had people like the Lincolns who were trying to get away from slavery and, and really bad land title uh, uh, situations. But they move it to Vandalia in 1820, the same year that Missouri becomes a state. And that's where Lincoln was most of the time as a state legislator in Vandalia. Uh, there's a problem with Vandalia though. It wasn't very big, so when all of the uh, when all of the representatives came to town, th th they really couldn't. It wasn't enough places for them to stay, and then after sessions, there wasn't a whole lot of things to do. So they said, you know, we need to find a better place. Plus, the population keeps growing and it's growing north. 
you're starting to see some come across further up, but it's still growing mostly north. So they decide we're going to move it from Vendalia. And Lincoln and the other members of the Long Nine, who were all the very tall members of the state legislature that were from the Sangamon region um, and all over, you know, average over six foot tall, they pushed to get the Capitol moved to Springfield. In the middle of all this, the Capitol building, the state, state house in Vendalia burns to the ground and they quickly build another one. To, to try to keep them there, but it was too late. I mean, the, they were already gone. And there's some question about whether Lincoln and the others were doing some log rolling, you know, you know, trading votes to try to get the thing to Springfield. Lincoln by this time is living up, um, you know, where the bottom of these two wells are in New Salem and going to Vendalia. And then he, so Springfield was much closer, but by that time he, he also moved to Springfield. So in fact, you know, everybody who, on this call has probably been to Springfield and they know that you know, his office was right across the street from it and his house was only a, a few blocks away. So that um, that's mainly the whole idea behind moving the capital and it does reflect this northward movement of people. Um, later you get more and more coming from the east and even through the Great Lakes and there's reasons for that which relate to the next topic which is um, which which is uh, internal improvements. So what is internal improvements? We would call them infrastructure today. So internal improvements or infrastructure projects. The Whigs were big promoters of what was called the American system of economic development. This is, this is internal improvements. The Whigs had gotten started originally as anti-Jacksonians. They were against Andrew Jackson's Democrats when Jackson was president. Originally, their leader was John Quincy Adams, who was in the House of Representatives after, after he was president. He, was in, he got elected to the House of Representatives, and he was a thorn in the slave power side for this whole time. Um, later, uh, Henry Clay became the leader of the Whigs, and this American system of economic development is really tied more with Henry Clay than with John Quincy Adams. So what is it exactly? What does that mean, American system? Well, the Whigs believe that to modernize the nation, you needed government-supported internal improvements, infrastructure projects, as well as a national bank to help finance those improvements and high tariffs to keep foreign investment out so that they, they could, wouldn't, they'd be able to compete better. So this was the, they wanted the federal government and even the state governments to build uh, these internal improvements, these infrastructure. So what is what, what, what do I mean by internal improvements? And first off, you're looking at roads. Now this isn't, they didn't look like this. this these roads, this is part of the interstate highway system that was built by another infrastructure project in the 1950s by uh, Dwight David Eisenhower was the interstate highway system. They didn't look like this. Lincoln was very familiar with the way roads looked back then. Uh, they were effectively where the horses went through the forest or went over across the field or, and later when wagons were being pulled across them. So when it rained, the mud would be up to the axles and up to the uh, knees of the, of the horses and the people. It was essentially impassable. And during the winter, when everything froze, then you have all these ruts, frozen ruts, which wasn't much better. So they needed to build roads and, and to improve roads. And, and really, mostly early on, especially this, this was just packed dirt and, and some drainage to, to make sure that they had something that was stable. It also included um, uh, making rivers more navigable. As Lincoln knew from his, uh, from his trips from the flatboat down to New Orleans, through the Ohio River and the Mississippi River, those rivers are very big, very wide, and deep enough that not only can they handle, um, not only can they handle uh, flatboats, but they can handle the steamships that were being built and just flooding the, uh, the big rivers, the Mississippi River in particular. But there were smaller rivers, like the Sangamon River that went through Salem. So Lincoln was being a bit, 
bit uh, self-serving here because you know New Salem wanted the Sangamon River to be uh, to be dredged, to be cleared. So uh, not only will you have the depth, but you had the big, small rivers like the Sangamon meandered a lot more. There are a lot of sharper turns. They were not as wide. There was a lot of brush from the sides that would grow into the, 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 the area where the boats should go. There was a lot of obstructions. And so the idea was to keep these things clear, build them, uh, clear them out and do some dredging where you could to, to make them uh, more navigable into the smaller rivers. Combined with that is the use of canals. Uh, this is a, a picture of canal boat I think I took in LaSalle a few years ago on the Illinois Michigan Canal. Um, canals could connect some of these smaller rivers so you wouldn't have to go all the way up into the smaller reaches of the river but you could you could kind of cut across and uh, there was a huge uh, idea to, to just keep building a lot of canals. Uh, the Illinois Michigan Canal in particular was one of Lincoln's favorites. He wanted to be the DeWitt Clinton of Illinois. And DeWitt Clinton, for those who don't recognize the name, was the governor of New York State when the Erie Canal was built. And in fact, before he was governor, he was instrumental in getting the Erie Canal built. So the Erie Canal runs from the Hudson River north of Albany um, across the state to Lake Erie. And it allowed huge growth in the economy of the upper part of New York. Uh, people could bring goods across from New England by land and then get into these, uh, these canal boats and bring them across to the Great Lakes where they could reach all of these other states from the Old and Northwest Territory. Uh, they could draw, run ships down along the coast and then up the, up the Hudson River uh, to the canal. And Lincoln saw that for the Illinois Michigan Canal and all these other canals, that it would improve the economy of the, of the area and it would have benefits nationwide at that time, at least in the North. The fourth part was railroads. Uh, Lincoln wasn't that keen on railroads initially um, in part because of the Sangamon River and also because of, of the cost, which I'll talk about in a minute. But whereas rivers, the big rivers really went from North to South. You went into the Mississippi, the Ohio and the Mississippi and you went down to New Orleans and that's where all the trading was. Railroads could help bring, uh, bring commerce and people across from east to west. And in fact, Lincoln played a major role in a big case in which a steamship on the uh, Mississippi River ran into the first railroad bridge across from Illinois into Iowa and burned, the, the steamship burned and part of the, the bridge burned. And they sued the bridge the railroad company. So you can't build these obstructions. We can't get up there. And Lincoln managed to uh, convince people that, uh, that they weren't going to be obstructions, that the railroads could build uh, bridges. So he played a major role in several of these issues, but he was, he was realistic. So remember when I said in 1832, when he's 23 years old, he runs for, uh, he, he runs for the state legislature and he loses this really, really long uh, uh, letter of introduction that is published in the Sangamon Journal, Sangamon Journal. But he says in that, time and experience have verified to a demonstration the public utility of internal improvements. I like this little line because it's, it's, it's a bit ostentatious, but it, uh, especially when you think, here's a 23-year-old saying, time and experience of which he has had z pretty much zero because he's been a farmer mostly up until this point. But he also says verified to a demonstration, which is actually a Euclid geometry term that he has not studied yet, but he has enough, uh, he has looked at math enough to understand what demonstration means. But he says that you know, clearly there's a public utility to these internal improvements. And he goes on to say that the poorest and the most thinly populated counties the most rural counties would greatly benefit from the opening of good roads and the clearing of navigable streams. He said, nobody can deny this. So this isn't gonna be just good for the big rich companies and big rich people who invest in railroads and canals and, and roads. This is going to be good for farmers who are going to be able to use these improvements to be able to sell their products um, further away 
uh, to, so they could grow some additional acres of corn and then eat what you, you would have and, and, and sell the rest for cash. Because they're shifting into this, uh, away from this barter and trade to a more of a cash economy anyway. But he also realized, you know, there are some problems that we have to be wary of. First, it'd be folly to undertake this or any other kind of improvement, knowing that we, without first knowing that you could finish them, because half finished work generally proves to be labor lost. This line will come back to bite him. Um, he says, there are also, you cannot justify any objection to having railroads and canals and any of these other things, as long as they don't cost anything, but obviously they do cost something. And the objection is the ability to pay for them. That also comes back to bite him. Remember, this is 1832. He's 23 years old. He's just, you know, settling in, in New Salem. He, he doesn't have a whole lot of experience, but he is a visionary. He's looking for. So a few years later, he's, he's, he's in the, in the um, state legislature, and he, he says, well, we, he's pushing the idea of internal improvements. And so, well, you know, we need to pay for this. How are we going to do that? So he goes for distributing the proceeds of the sales of the public lands, meaning the federal public lands, to the several states to enable Illinois and other states to dig canals, construct railroads, build roads, do all of these things without having to borrow money and paying interest on it because you know, the, the federal government is in a better position by just selling off just a little bit of its vast amounts of, of territory, which remember in 1836 did not include all of that uh, territory we got from the Mexican War. It was mainly just the uh, the upper part of Louisiana Purchase, but they could sell off some of that and give that money to the states to do this. Okay, this is where things get a little dicey because a year later, in uh, 1837, there's a crash of the financial system, and largely because of Wall Street speculation that had a reverberating effect down through the rest of the states. And even though Illinois didn't, didn't do anything to create it, it got hurt by it, as did all the other places. So they just didn't have the money anymore. And in fact, they took um, many, many years to pay off this debt created by a lot of it was this internal improvements and other things because of this um, uh, crash, this financial collapse, which happened way too often back then. I mean, I guess it happens even today for probably a lot of the same reasons. So that was part of the problem with this that he pulled out that he had mentioned about, you know, as long as you can pay for them, there's no problem. It says, except now they're in debt. The other part of this that was a problem, the half finished work generally proves to be labor lost. A lot of these internal improvements projects, just think about this. You have all of these uh, state legislatures legislators around the state, they're all looking to get projects put in their districts. Um, and they all have a brother-in-law who wants to start a company. So there's a lot of, you know, there, there, was some, there was some corruption that was involved with letting out contracts. Uh, there were a lot of companies that got money, but they didn't, they weren't really well managed. Uh, there wasn't very good oversight. Uh, there was a lot of poor management. So you got a lot of short canals that didn't really do what they were supposed to do. You had companies that would build a few miles of railroad track and then, and then nothing would connect to them. Um, there were a lot of company failures. So there were a lot of problems on top of the debt problem. Uh, but Lincoln stuck to his guns about this. He really, decided, he really felt that internal improvements were critical for the, for the economy of Illinois. And he, and he was right, but these, these other issues uh, kind of overshadowed that. So that's the other big issue in, in Illinois. There's one last big issue in Illinois that I want to talk about. And this obviously relates to the rest of the country. Remember, Illinois is part of this Northwest Ordinance uh, territories. So the area that became Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, Michigan, Wisconsin were all part of this Northwest territory. And as such, slavery was banned. They were all free states. That said, Illinois was not particularly welcoming to African Americans. Neither was Indiana or Ohio. It all had very strict black laws to try to keep black people out of the state. They, there were some within. There, there, there certainly were some free uh, blacks in Illinois, um, 
but they had very few rights. Uh, they, you know, land ownership was a problem. They getting loans was a problem. Uh, the ability to uh, serve on juries was a problem. I mean, they were they were they were sec considered second class citizens. Illinois and the others wanted to do this to try to keep them out of there, because even though it was a free state, it doesn't mean they were an egalitarian society. Um, there were several black families that lived around Lincoln, though, and Lincoln was much more egalitarian in that respect. But L Illinois um, was in the same position that a lot of these free states were. Um, the slave power still controlled Congress. They still controlled what happened in the United States, and they, they would con con continue to control Congress and, and, the, um, and the presidency right up until Lincoln. So what, it, what they had done is managed to get through what essentially is a gag rule in Congress. They said, you can't talk about slavery and you certainly can't talk about abolition in the Congress, US Congress. So they did the same in the individual free states like Illinois and some of the others. And they, they basically convinced Illinois to pass a set of resolutions because they didn't want to have abolitions. So Illinois pass and they say, we highly disapprove the formation of abolitionist societies and of the doctrines promulgated by them. Abolitionist agitation was considered a worse problem by the slave states for sure um, than slavery itself. In fact, Illinois in their, in their bill says the right to property and slaves is sacred, not just legal, sacred to the slaveholding states and protected by the federal constitution. Thirdly, they said that the general government, Congress cannot abolish slavery in the District of Columbia, which is a federal territory. It says, why would Illinois be even saying anything about the District of Columbia? And the reason is again, because this was all being pushed by slave powers and getting a lot of you know, nods and smiles from uh, the, uh, the main populace in Illinois and these other free states that would prefer not to have black people living there. If they knew that if the District of Columbia federal territory could have slavery abolished by Congress, then why couldn't Congress abolish slavery in all the other federal territories? Which again was at this point still just the uh, Louisiana Purchase Northern part. So this passes overwhelmingly 95 to six. In fact, it passed unanimously in the Illinois Senate and 77 to six in the House. Lincoln was one of those six. So Lincoln um, gets together with Dan Stone, who was one of the other six, and they write this protest. They want to explain why they voted against it. Because Lincoln, you know, isn't an abolitionist, but he wants to explain where his position is. And so they do. The institution of slavery is founded on both injustice and bad policy. It's wrong. It's morally wrong. It's a horrible thing. We shouldn't have slavery. It has to go. It's, also, it's just bad policy. It's bad political policy, social policy, economic policy. It shouldn't be there. We need to get rid of it. That said, abolitionist doctrines increase rather than abate its evils. And that sort of is counterintuitive until you understand what he means by that. Abolitionist doctrines, abolitionists um, basically wanted either the federal government to just pass a law to, to ban slavery in all the states where it existed, but mainly they spent their time trying to shame the states in where slavery was and shame slave owners by, by repeatedly saying how bad slavery is, but also that slave owners are evil and slave states are evil. And you think about it, what happens when you call somebody deplorable? They get defensive. They don't want to change. And Lincoln says that's counterproductive. You, you need to have these people change. And they're not going to change if you're constantly beating them over the head. So it needs to be a different way. And besides that, Congress has no power to interfere with slavery in the states. Now, this, this wasn't just Lincoln that was saying this. This was considered the federal consensus. Everybody, essentially believed that the federal government, with a few exceptions, the federal government um, didn't have any power to, 
to ban slavery in the states. And most abolitionists understood that Congress didn't really have the power to ban slavery in the states where it still existed. The idea of abolitionists was to pressure the, the, the slave states to give slaves up, give up slavery themselves, which is what happened in the Northern states. So Lincoln says Congress can't do it. You know, they don't have any power to get rid of slavery in the states, but Congress does have the power to abolish slavery in the District of Columbia. District of Columbia is a federal territory. Congress has power over the federal territories. It can get rid of slavery in the District of Columbia. So Lincoln stays consistent with these four principles throughout his entire political career. So people talk about while well, Lincoln evolved in his views on slavery, he didn't really. He had these principles back when he was 28 uh, years old, uh, something like that. When he's back in Illinois, he stuck to these basic principles his and all the way through, through, through his presidency. What did change was the tactics that became available for him to use and others to use to try to get rid of slavery. And he always felt that abolitionist doctrines weren't going to help. There had to be another way. Um, and that's, a, that's something maybe for the Q&A, we can talk about the other ways. But this is the third part of um, the idea of, uh, of what happened in Illinois when he was in the state legislature. So let's talk a little bit about his one term in the House of Representatives. Like, uh, you know, like most freshman congressmen, um, then and now, you know, you come in as a freshman congressman, you're told to sit in the back of the room, you know, keep your mouth shut and vote the way the party leaders tell you. Now, we know that Lincoln sat in the back of the room because if you go into the statuary hall in the Capitol, which was the House of Representatives at the time that Lincoln was there, there's a little brass plaque way in the back of the room that says Lincoln's desk. That's where Lincoln was. In fact, right now it sits, you know, just a little bit in front of where the door is. That says the Lincoln Room, which is where Lincoln used to hang out and which the Lincoln Group with DC uh, was instrumental in helping to get named the Lincoln. So he did sit in the back of the room and he did vote the way the party leaders told him to vote. He wasn't so good about keeping his mouth shut. He wanted to make a name for himself. And he it was just some guy who just liked to just move forward and do things. So one of the things he did was he introduced a series of resolutions demanding that the current president, James K. Polk, explain exactly what spot on US land, Mexico, supposedly had attacked us. Because that was the premise that Polk had said, uh, Mexico has attacked us on American soil, we need to repel them. And that was the beginning of the Mexican War. I think everyone kind of understood that it was a pretense, that the idea was to claim the land uh, of, of Texas in particular, but all the rest of the land that we got out of the Mexican War um, for slavery. And he repeated in these resolutions several times the term spot. You know, we, I want to know the spot where this took place. I want to know the spot where you're saying that they attacked us. And he became known as Spotty Lincoln, and it was not a compliment. Um, in fact, the Democratic Party at the time used this against him. Uh, when he uh, was, when at the end of the, uh, the his term, when he was running for re-election, was saying that, well, he didn't support the Mexican War, which is not technically true. He, he thought the Mexican War was started illegally and on pretense, but he supported the troops and he always voted to fund the troops. So, but he got known as Spotty Lincoln. And this is part of the reason why um, if he had run for re-election, he might not have won anyway. And in fact, uh, I think it was Hardin that ran in his place again and, and didn't win. <clears throat> so that was one of the issues. Now, you want, what did James K. Polk do? Did he like explain himself? And James K. Polk said, Lincoln who? And said not, and just ignored him. And the Democratic Party ignored him. And most of the Whig Party ignored him. I mean, not much happened from this other than it kind of hurt him back home. Another issue was, of course, internal improvements. You know, he was a big internal improvement guy. So he doesn't get a whole lot, freshmen in particular, don't get a lot of airtime in the House of Representatives. 
So he used one of his times to give a, get a speech on internal improvements, specifically to get hold for funding of the Illinois Michigan Canal. Um, he explained in detail why, uh, uh, why the argument uh, wasn't correct that, uh, that people were offering, which was that if you, why should the federal government give money to individual states for local projects that would benefit the local populace and the local state? And Lincoln explained, it doesn't just benefit the local states, it improves commerce and transportation that affects all of the, at least the Northern states, um, for the Illinois Michigan Canal. And he was successful. They, they built the Illinois Michigan Canal and he in fact goes through it on his way back home. Now, speaking of going back home, everybody um, talks about now about how the House of Representatives and especially, you know, they don't spend a lot of time working. Uh, that's not really true. I mean, that's, they go home when they're not in session here, they're at home in their, in their districts. But way back when Lincoln was, was in the House of Representatives, it was clearly a part-time job. They had two very short sessions, and in between, they went back to their day jobs, and Lincoln went back to being a lawyer during many months where he was back home. But before he went back home, after the first session, he went up into New England to campaign for Zachary Taylor. This is 1848. Zachary Taylor is the Whig uh, representative or the Whig nominee for president. And Lincoln goes through Massachusetts, and gives several speeches and Zachary Taylor wins and it also gives uh, Lincoln a little bit of exposure, which helps. Uh, one of the cool things I like about this trip is that when he goes back home, he goes through upstate New York. Um, I don't remember if he goes through the Erie Canal or not, but he goes through, through upstate New York, gets to Buffalo and goes over and sees Niagara Falls. Uh, he then goes through on, on steamships, he goes through the Great Lakes, and he sees a, another steamship get stuck uh, in the, the shallow uh, shoals in the, on the Detroit River on the way down. And this helps inspire him along with his own experiences on a flat boat uh, and led eventually during the intercession between the two sessions to his patent uh, for getting uh, boats over shoals. So I think that's pretty cool. I, I actually I talk about a lot about some of this stuff in, in my book that's coming up. So the last thing that he dealt with was DC Emancipation Bill. There's a lot of stuff going on for somebody who was a one-term congressman who people just kind of write off and say he didn't really do much. Uh, the DC Emancipation Bill, as consistent with what he said back in Illinois, the Congress has a right to abolished slavery in the District of Columbia. It's a federal territory. So he puts together a bill. He gets support from the city. He gets support from Joshua Giddings, who is a, a big abolitionist, and that they, they actually share um, a boarding house while he's in, in Congress. Um, but then the slaveholding states start pushing back. And it really was a non-starter. And when you think about this, this is 1848, I think when he introduced this, uh, they had just finished the Mexican war and the United States had grabbed all of the land that is now what is Arizona, New Mexico, California, Oregon, Utah, Nevada, uh, maybe Colorado, parts of what is, uh, I don't know, part of Texas, not to mention Texas, which had already been annexed. You know, all of those places had just been captured. So the slaveholding powers were not about to see a precedent set where the Congress can get rid of slavery in a federal territory because they saw all of that new federal territory as potential slave states for the power it could provide more than a place to grow cotton. So he goes back home, he does all the things I mentioned in that other slide. And eventually 1858, he comes back and he starts to debate Lincoln Doug, uh, and Stephen A. Douglas, which was actually probably the Douglas-Lincoln debates because Douglas was the well-known uh, leader of the, the Democrats, not only in Illinois, but in the US Congress. Um, and he came back during the 1858 for his reelection campaign. And even though most people didn't really campaign, uh, he came back because he wanted to explain popular sovereignty. So Lincoln follows him around and uh, and says, you know, OK, Douglas finished talking, uh, you know, but I'm going to rebut him. Come back tonight or tomorrow morning and I will I will tell you where Douglas was totally wrong. 
So he finally pushes Douglas into getting a, um, into uh, having these seven joint debates where the first person would get up, speak for 60 minutes. The next person would get up and speak for 90. And then the first person would come back with a 30 minute rejoinder and they would alternate the order when they, for, for each of these different places. And they started in Ottawa, um, which is towards the Northern part of the state. Then went all the way North to Freeport, then all the way South to Jonesboro. And then they did this kind of counter, counterclockwise thing from Charleston, Galesburg, Quincy, and Alton. Um, they did many, many, many other uh, uh, debates and speeches during this time, maybe a hundred speeches each by themselves. But these are the seven that they did together in this format. And it really laid out the, 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 the positions that each of them were taking and the two parties were taking. And by this time, Lincoln is a Republican. So Douglas says, why, why can it not exist divided into free and slave states? So Douglas is kind of riffing off of Lincoln's house divided speech, which he had given that summer before the debates, where he said a house divided, uh, you know, the, the nation cannot remain half permanently half free and half slave. Douglas said, why not? He says, Washington, Jefferson, Franklin, Madison, Hamilton, Jay, you should all recognize those names. He says, they made this government divided into free states and slave states. Now this should grab you as being false because it is false. These, uh, remember when the, the, the Declaration of Independence was signed, all of the colonies and all of the new states, the 13 states were all slaves and allowed slavery because the British colonies allowed slavery because the British system allowed slavery. So slavery existed everywhere. When the constitution was formed, there were a few places that were getting rid of, some of the Northern states were getting rid of slavery. I think maybe Vermont may have been the only one who actually had gotten rid of it officially, but the others were in the process of doing it. Most of it was gradual. They certainly did not set up the constitution to say, okay, these states are free and these states are slave. That's the way it's going to be. They didn't say that at all. They hid the, the word slave and slavery in the constitution. And they only alluded to its presence because they didn't really want it. And in fact, they wanted it gone. They wanted it on a path to ultimate extinction, which is what Lincoln's position was. So Lincoln um, goes on and at one point he says, I'm pledged to the belief in the right and duty of Congress to prohibit slavery in all of the United States territories. So not only the District of Columbia, but all of the US territories, which by this time includes not only the Louisiana Purchase areas that are still there, but the, um, all of the land that was taken from Mexico, uh, not counting California, which has already become a state. So he thinks, hey, Congress has a right to prohibit slavery, prohibit slavery. This is the Republican platform. We do not want slavery to be extended into the territories. That is the main reason for the, for the Republican Party. Um, and if, if somebody can ask me about, like, well, how does keeping slavery out of the territories uh, somehow end slavery in the states where it still existed um, in the Q&A, if somebody could ask me that, that would be... Yeah, I'd be happy to, to dive into that. Douglas says, if the people of a territory want slavery, they will have it. And if they do not want it, you cannot force it on them. This is effectively succinctly saying what uh, has become known as the Freeport Doctrine, because uh, Lincoln brought it out of, of Douglas in the Freeport in the second debate. Uh, Lincoln essentially been saying this anyway, but this... Lincoln was able to get him to say explicitly, if a territory doesn't want slavery, they cannot be forced to have it. They can keep slavery out of it. This is the big reason why the slave states in the South, the Southern Democrats didn't like Douglas two years later when it got to the presidential election. I'll talk about that a little bit in a bit. Lincoln, uh, reiterates at one point, I contemplate slavery as a moral, social, and political evil. So when people say, well, he didn't speak out enough against slavery, he did. I mean, he said, 
repeatedly, slavery is wrong. I cannot remember when I didn't think so. You know, slavery, if slavery is not wrong, nothing is wrong. Slavery is a moral, social, political evil. It has to go. Slavery is wrong. But I don't know how to get rid of it. Having due regard for its actual existence among us in the slave states and the difficulties of getting rid of it in any satisfactory way. He's not sure exactly how to get rid of it because he, he's already said the federal government, the federal consensus is that Congress cannot just pass a law. The states have to get rid of slavery. The Northern states did one by one. The Southern states have to do it one by one. So what do you have to do to incentivize them to go that way? And that was becoming harder and harder and harder by this point. So let's talk about him running for president. Um, so he's quickly moving up, you know, he's state, state legislature, he was uh, in Congress for one term, and now he's running for president. Now, back then, people didn't overtly run for president, they were supposed to be drafted by their party. And so they're kind of stealth candidates, Lincoln was even stealthier than the others, because he wasn't even on the radar. You know, there was a list put out in uh, December or, or of 1859 or, or January of 1860 that listed um, a dozen of people who might be getting the nomination. There's a big picture of, uh, of William Seward right in the middle because he was a presumed nominee. And Lincoln wasn't even on that list. But Lincoln did some things that suddenly brought him into a viable candidate. And first off, he gave us an address at Cooper Union, the end of February of 1860. And in that, he quotes Stephen A. Douglas, who had said recently before this, our fathers, when they framed the government under which we live, understood this question, slavery, just as well and even better than we do now. And then his argument was like back in that first, uh, that, that first quote I mentioned, that they set us up as free states and slave states, which isn't true. And Lincoln, in fact, used a good part of the 90 minute Cooper Union address, probably 45 or 50 minutes, going step by step by step in a logical progression, explaining how the founders who he had identified and following and checking into their votes, their statements and their actions to determine how they felt about slavery. And he said the, the majority were definitely anti-slavery. The idea was to try to put slavery on a path to its ultimate extinction. We wanted to get rid of it. That's why they hid it in the constitution so that it wasn't so obvious. Um, they took steps to get rid of it, such as the Northwest Ordinance and the Missouri Compromise and getting rid of the international slave trade. They did this in order to get rid of slavery. So he goes on for a, quite a long time talking about that. And then he says, um, in the middle part, he talks to uh, Southerners and he says, you know, we're not going to, we're not going to attack slavery where it exists. That's up to you. We can't do anything about it. We'll certainly encourage you to get rid of it, but we're, we, we're not going to do anything. So if something happens, secession or war, which everybody had been talking about for years, it's not like it came as a shock, um, that it'll be on you. Now, he sort of repeats this idea in his first inaugural. You know, it's not on us. It's on you. If war should come, it's because you started it. Then he goes back and he talks to Republicans at the end. And he says, we need to have faith that right makes might. And that faith to the end, dare us to do the duty as we understand it. He says, we are on a right side of history here. We are right to block expansion of slavery. We are right to encourage the end of slavery in those states where it exists by <clears throat> constitutional means, not by extra constitutional means. This is consistent totally consistent with what he was saying way back in his protests in Illinois. So um, he actually, uh, so, oh, let me, let me get back. Let me talk about the, uh, let me talk about the election. I almost forgot the election. So in 1860, they have a presidential election. You've probably heard about it. 
And after Cooper Union, he runs up to New England again. They give speeches in Connecticut, Rhode Island, and New Hampshire. Um, he doesn't go to Massachusetts because he's already been there years before, but he gives these speeches. Effectively, he is kind of reiterating what he said in Cooper Union speech. This does a couple of things. First, it helps uh, get the people of New England to understand this, the concept of, you know, hey, this is, this is the Republican platform. This is what slavery means. Uh, this is what the founders believed in, and they wanted to get rid of slavery. But it also made him uh, much more visible to the public because he, like I said, he was he was getting some party recognition, but he wasn't that recognizable to the public. He was this you know hick lawyer from the West. He also, right after this Cooper Union, he published the book of the Lincoln Douglas debates. So he took all of the Douglas speeches from Douglas's uh, Douglas friendly newspapers because they would treat Douglas well and they would clean up because Douglas had a tendency to use the N word like constantly and they would clean that up and they would um, and those papers would make sure they got his statements right. So he took the Douglas speeches from those Douglas friendly papers and the Lincoln speeches came from Lincoln friendly papers because they would do the same thing. They would make sure that Lincoln was everything was all the dots, I's were dotted and the T's were crossed and both sets of papers would maybe not quite get the text right in for the other guy. So he he puts these all in a book along with a couple other speeches and he gets it published. And it's very widely uh, distributed and widely read. So everybody knows about um, the two positions, Lincoln and Douglas, but also um, Republican and Democrat. This is reiterating what had happened two years before because all of those speeches had been covered very widely in the newspapers. So now they're getting a second, you know, a, a second viewing. And in fact, he becomes a surprise nominee of the Republican Party. It's a surprise because everybody thought that uh, William Seward, the longtime uh, governor and senator and, and, and party leader, would be the nominee. Uh, everybody looked to the person that had been around for a long time. And then this tall, gangly guy from Illinois comes out of nowhere and becomes gets the nomination. So he was a surprise, in large part because he didn't have the kind of track record that Seward had, and also people like Chase and Cameron and Bates. They all had track records that people could look back on. They all had some negatives. Lincoln was a nice guy. You know, he, he, was, he was a good talker. Uh, nobody really knew much about him. They thought he was fairly moderate. And so he seemed like a good person. So he goes and he wins. Now we get split between four candidates. Lincoln's a Republican. The Northern Democrats nominate Stephen A. Douglas. The Southern Democrats nominate John C. Breckinridge, who is the outgoing vice president. And to make matters worse, John Bell um, becomes the, the head of the Constitutional Union Party, which existed pretty much on paper just for the election. Um, and their platform was, uh, they didn't have a platform. They're basically just, so let's keep everything the way it is and let's all get along. And they actually did surprisingly well in the election. Now, one would ask, and I would hope that people in this group would ask, why did the Democrats split? You know, that, that was silly. Um, they knew that if they split, that the Republican would get elected, that they would lose, right? And in fact, they did. The Southern Democrats, when they went to and had their first uh, convention, which was in, in uh, Charleston, South Carolina, they didn't like Douglas. They didn't think Douglas was strong enough in protecting slavery. They didn't like the idea of popular sovereignty. They didn't like the idea that territories might be able to keep slavery out of there. They wanted to go with Dred Scott. Dred Scott decision said, you can take your, your enslaved uh, people anywhere you want in the territories. And then kind of in invisible ink, small print was, well, you could also bring them into states, free states. And that was what Lincoln was worried about, that it would spread to free states. But they knew um, going in that they, if they didn't all back Douglas, that there was no way the Democratic Party was going to win. And they decided to do it anyway. Um, remember I mentioned the Cooper Union speech, Lincoln mentioned the by secession and, and more. Everybody knew that the Southern Democrats were going to leave because the idea 
the, when you look at the Democrats and Northern and Southern Democrats, the big difference wasn't their views on slavery. They were pro-slavery Democrats, on the, the predominantly pro-slavery Democrats, both in the North and the South. And there was just as much white supremacy in the North as there was in the South. The difference was the Northern Democrats and the Republicans and all the other Northerners were for union. They were unionists. The Southern Democrats were for secession. They figured we're losing control of the Congress. We're losing control of the presidency. All of these uh, states, uh, territories, as they become states like California, they'll become free states. And we're going to lose our power. And that's going to eventually going to kill slavery. Our only choice is to leave the union, secede, set up our own country where we can protect slavery. They knew that going in. In fact, South Carolina had been arguing basically that point for, for years. So that's why they had to split. It wasn't just they weren't paying attention or they, they didn't realize what was happening. They knew what would happen. In any case, uh, Lincoln wins and he wins with 39% of the popular vote, which doesn't sound like that much because it's not a majority. Um, however, the next in line, I think, was uh, 24 or 5% uh, and then it went down from there. Um, so it was actually a fairly large um, plurality that he won by. And when you look at the electoral votes, he won 180 electoral votes. <clears throat> 180 was more than three was more than the other three combined. So it wasn't as close as some people think. So what happened? What did he do as president? This will be my, my last slide. Um, he looked at three big issues and, and they're not gonna sound be surprising. The first is internal improvements. And it sounds a little funny because they're gonna be in the middle of civil war, but internal improvements was a big deal during Lincoln's presidency. Uh, remember that when the South seceded, they took all of their senators and congressmen out of Congress. Republicans won a lot of seats when Lincoln won. So it was a Republican dominated Congress. Republicans are the most recent iteration of Whigs. So they still believed in the idea of this, um, uh, of this, uh, this idea of uh, federal government uh, supporting internal improvements. And so they passed laws and Lincoln signed them, including the Homestead Act, which the federal government would give land to farmers out in the territories so to encourage westward expansion. They could live on that land for, for a small little fee, but basically free. Uh, and if they kept it growing for five years, then it was theirs, up to 160 acres. That was a lot. Uh, they also passed the Morrill Land Grant Act, which gave, again, federal land and federal monies to the states to create land grant colleges that would um, hit another aspect of the, the Whig and Republican philosophy, which was education. They would teach scientific bases. They would teach science and engineering. The, you think of Texas saying an M, it was originally Texas agricultural and mechanical, which was the, 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 what the, these land grant colleges would, would teach. Uh, there was also the Department of Agriculture was, was created to bring science to, to agriculture. Uh, they, uh, Lincoln got to pick the Transcontinental Railroad, the Pacific Railroad Act. He got to pick where it started in the North. Now, this has been something that had been in the works for a long, long time. Uh, Jefferson Davis, when he was Secretary of War under Pierce, had been a big proponent to the Transcontinental Railroad. But he, of course, wanted it to run through the South because it would help uh, stimulate the, the uh, encourage slavery to expand. The Northerners wanted to have it be in the North because it would encourage free uh, transportation, free uh, settling out into the West. And it made more sense because the North had a lot more uh, people living in it than the South. And it was much more advanced than in the South. And I'll, I'll actually talk about that more next week. Uh, what else did he do? Oh, oh Yosemite Yen Land Grant, uh, Yosemite Grant. Lincoln signed into law the Yosemite uh, Grant to provide or give the land of Yosemite Valley and the Mariposa Grove, big trees in California to the state of California so that California could protect it 
for the long-term public good. Um, eventually, California, uh, a couple of decades later, would give it back to the federal government and it would become, I think it was the third national park um, formation. This is the first time that federal land is put aside by government edict to be preserved for all time. You, you think of Teddy Roosevelt and the Park Service and the, and the national park system, Lincoln really was the beginning of the national park system in, in the overall view. So those are a lot of these internal improvement type projects. There obviously were a lot of other things too, like huge government expenditures on weaponry um, and manufacturing and railroads and telegraphs. You know, All of these things expanded. These were all infrastructure projects. The second big issue was slavery. Um, Lincoln obviously passed or signed the Emancipation Proclamation, which would get rid of slavery in the states that were still in, um, in rebellion. This is important both because it, it was issued as a, as a military order because he can't arbitrarily ban slavery, abolish slavery in the states in which it exists. But you had all of these states that said, we're not states anymore, we're our own country. Lincoln said, well, you're still part of our country, but you're in rebellion. So, you know, I can use my war powers to uh, ban slavery because slavery, uh, you, because the South was using African-Americans by slave labor to do all of the manual labor and, and, and cooking and everything else for the soldiers, whereas the North, uh, the soldiers had to do all of that. So it would have a military benefit, but it would also get, uh, it would incentivize uh, uh, African-Americans to run across and to get into uh, union lines, which would make them free. So he did that, but he was careful not to include the border states. These are the four border states of, uh, that were union, the state in the union, but were slave states, because just like they were before the war, they, the government can't do anything to ban slavery in those states. Lincoln did try to keep them in by convince them to get rid of slavery unilaterally by saying, you know, within your state, it will incentivize it. We'll even provide federal funds so that you can compensate uh, owners for, for, for manumitting their slaves. Uh, none of them bought it during, mostly during the war. At the very end of the war in 1864, uh, some of them started to do that. Uh, the Emancipation Proclamation also allowed for the formation of the U.S. Colored Troops, the USCT, where African-Americans and former slaves, many free and some former slaves, could fight for their, not only the freedom of the country and the freedom of the Union, but for their own freedom and their own rights. Uh, there was the 13th Amendment because Lincoln understood, as anybody who's seen the, the Spielberg movie, uh, Lincoln knows that uh, Lincoln understood that the Emancipation Proclamation was a war order, was an executive order, and that it wouldn't hold uh, after the war was over. He needed to amend the Constitution, so he pushed for the 13th Amendment. And the final issue that Lincoln dealt with that dealt with slavery was D.C. Emancipation. So going all the way back where he said in Illinois that uh, the federal government, that Congress could get rid of uh, slavery in, in District Columbia. And when he was a congressman, he tried to get a bill through himself. And now as, as president, the Congress passes and he signs that the District of Columbia slavery is ended. Um, in fact, a month or two later, I can't remember the exact dates, Congress passed another bill that Lincoln signed that would end slavery forever banned slavery in all of the territories, all of out west, all of the territories that remain, all the slavery would be banned forever in those states. Last up is obviously the Civil War. Uh, Lincoln had a few things to do during the Civil War and that is the subject of next week's talk. So I am going to end here um, and, and go to questions. Uh, just I'll point out real quick that the uh, these are my the two books. The Lincoln, The Man Who Saved America has been out for a while, and uh, you can still get that on Amazon and Barnes & Noble and get it from me. And uh, I'll give you a sneak peek of my, my new book, Lincoln, The Fire of Genius, in which I talk about Lincoln's commitment to science and technology and helped it, how, how it helped modernize America. So I touched on some of that today, and I'll touch on some of it next week, but I go into a lot more depth in the book. So let, it's, let's... Uh,
let's call it quits and let's go to uh, go to questions. And hopefully we uh, hopefully we have some questions. Thank you very much, David. Uh, very helpful. I see some quizzical looks. <laughs> Who wants to chime in first? Uh, David, you did ask to be reminded of the, what is the implication of uh, keeping slavery out of the territory. How would that put slavery on the path to extinction under Lincoln's theory? I'm glad you asked that, John. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, slavery, <clears throat> you know, that was, the, that was the Republican platform to keep slavery out of the, out of the territories. That was that was most of their platform. They they did carry in uh, these other issues, um, with the, uh, the the infrastructure issues, the Homestead Act, and other things like that. But uh, their main issue and their main reason for the Republican Party forming in the first place was to be anti-Nebraska, to be anti-popular um, sovereignty, to be anti-spread of slavery into the territories. And the idea was that this would help. Um, stimulate the end of slavery in the states in which, which it existed. And part of that would be simply by uh, constriction, like a boa constrictor, you know, which I'll actually talk about, like an anaconda, which I'll talk about next week. <laughs> um, that if it couldn't grow, it would eventually, you know, die under its own weight. And it would create a, a market the dynamics that would make it less and less uh, uh, profitable for them. But that's not the whole thing. Um, and I don't know if I've ever seen it listed out, but it, it's probably somebody has listed out. Burlingame, I'm sure, has listed it out somewhere. But the, but the idea would be once you have it constricted where it can't spread, then you could start incentivizing its end in certain states. And you look at how the Civil War worked out and you had the border states. So you could start with even um, uh, uh, West Virginia. West Virginia was the Western, uh, the Western counties of Virginia. And they weren't too keen on this whole idea of slavery and weren't too keen on this whole idea of leaving the union. And they split off and they eventually became West Virginia. And technically they came in as a slave state, but they very quickly passed laws getting rid of slavery. But all the rest of those four, the, the other four uh, border states, they all had very few enslaved people relative to the white population. And they, those numbers were going down in part because they were selling them off further south to, to make profits. But some were also being manumitted, and, and, but the numbers were going down and they didn't really have the, uh, the big crop like cotton to grow up in those northern uh, upper, upper, upper south border states. So you could work on them and do what Lincoln tried to do during Civil War is say, well, if you get rid of slavery in your state, <clears throat> the federal government will provide you the funds to be able to pay off the owners who are manumitting their enslaved uh, populations. And that would eventually, that would reduce the number of slave states because now they would have, they would have gotten rid of slavery. And then you start working on the next tier, the upper South, the ones who were late to the party, were they late to join the Confederacy? Only after Sumter did they join the Confederacy, like Virginia, North Carolina. They also didn't have as many slaves per, you know, as a poor proportion of the white population. So they would have been somebody that they could have convinced to get rid of slavery. And then it would have gotten to the point where not only would the, there would have been way more um, free states than slave states in the Congress, but it would have removed a lot of the financial um, profit making that the, the, the deep South states were have. And those, those deep Souths, they were, almost lost causers in the sense that you had places like uh, South Carolina and I think uh, Mississippi, Alabama that had not only a majority of African-Americans of their population, but uh, like 70, 80% of their population was enslaved African-Americans compared to, to the white population. And in some counties, there was 90, 95% enslaved people were 
of the population were enslaved people. So some of them, it would have been very, very difficult, but you, you would eventually be uh, kind of constricting them further and further and further and disincentivizing the idea. Um, plus you would have the votes eventually to pass an amendment to, to get rid of slavery. And in fact, if you look at, if you look at the states, uh, I'll, I, I think I'll, I'm actually gonna talk a little bit, I think about this next week. But if you look at the number of states that were free and slave states, Beginning of the Civil War, there was actually a, a, a one or two more free states because of new states coming in. By the end of the war, there were many more because Maryland got rid of slavery. Um, you have some questions about whether, you know, Tennessee and Louisiana really count as states, but they got rid of slavery. And there were some others that were getting rid of slavery. So there were actually many more free states by the end of the war than there were at the beginning. And they eventually would have enough states being free states that they could vote in a, a ban on slavery through a constitutional amendment, just like the 13th Amendment, without even having a, the southern states vote for it. How did the uh, confiscation acts uh, help Lincoln further his purpose? Uh, I, I guess they helped a lot. They uh, basically, they, uh, they gave permission uh, well, in, in some ways, they uh, codified and made legal what was already happening, um, both by, by Lincoln and by some generals. Um, but it, they, it did make it a, a policy and legal policy to, um, to effectively start taking in uh, people who are escaping across Union lines. And a lot of, a lot of the uh, former slaves that escaped into Union lines, they were put to work and paid. They, they, got, they got paid gigs doing the kinds of things they were doing, forced to do for free in, in the South. So they, it did help. And it, it also helped constitutionally because, you know, there were a lot of questions about whether some of the things Lincoln was doing were, you know, allowed by the Constitution or not. I think they were. But. Carol, why don't you ask your own question there? That's a good one. Mm -hmm. Well, I, it seems to me um, Lincoln is often popularly regarded as a wise statesman, and that can give the impression that he was somehow above political dealing. No way. Can you reflect on how you see the mix of principle and political in Lincoln? Uh, I guess it defines, it depends on how you, you define um, political dealing. I mean, I mean, politics is all about uh, reaching consensus, uh, uh, convincing people, persuasion, um, some compromises. I mean, you, you have different people with different points of view. You have to negotiate. I mean, that's part of that's part of politics. That's part of business. Yeah, but didn't he also it. play the game in terms of uh, using politics to make appointments that would help shore up his agenda? And I mean, short of actually bribing people, he was pretty much a wire puller, don't you think? He, yeah, again, it's depending on how you, how you want to interpret. You know, he, he like everybody before him, and you know, put people into place um, for political reasons. You know, you, you, in the past, they, the, all of the presidents, they get to name thousands of people all the way down to postmaster of some little town in, in Illinois, you know, they, they, they get to put these people in place for patronage and they pick people that will be supportive of the party. And that's, that's how it worked. That's why we have a civil service system now and not a patronage system now because, because there are problems with that system. On the other hand, um, he picked a lot of people because they weren't his party. A lot of the generals were, were Democrats because he needed to have the Democrats supporting the war effort. Um, he picked people for a lot of the other positions, uh, the, uh, the, 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 port, the port people that collected the uh, duties, um, the tariff money and everything. Those are very powerful positions. And he, he made sure that he got uh, people from the Democratic Party and people from different parts of the country into those positions because he needed that support um, for the government. So he was less ideological 
I guess, than, than um, a lot of other people were. But he certainly, he certainly did some wheeling and dealing. I think from an ethical perspective, I mean, you could, do, you could wheel and deal unethically or you could wheel and deal ethically. And I think he did it from an ethical perspective. Um, I'm sure there's somebody could come up with an example where they question that. But would you say that overall he would tend to use the political uh, levers to advance the ethical agenda that he had, rather than for personal power or oh, yeah. aggrandizement? Yeah, I don't. I don't think he was much of a um, a power monger, and, and he was he wasn't egotistical or or somebody that would do things because he wanted to show how strong he was, or, you know that that kind of thing. I think he was a very secure guy, and he would do things because he thought that was the way he had to get it done to get to the place that he wanted to go to, and he right. always felt that he wanted to go to a place that was right for the country. Not, not, you know, what's right for me, like we have with some people, um, but what's right for the country. So I, you know, you, you have to, you have to look at the bigger picture and you look at, look at his whole life. And I think he was a, uh, he was a, he was one of these people who cares about other people and he cares about doing something, doing right for the country. Not just as for opposed the country, to doing right for, for doing what's most profitable all to him. Places. <laughs> I'm sorry, what? Not just for the country, for all time and all the world. He said that yes. more than once. I agree. I, I think he, he had a, a much broader perspective than just the country because he, he did realize and said outright many times that, you know, if the country failed, if our democracy failed, then it just shows that democracy can't work and that it, you would never have democracy anywhere else in the world. You go back to monarchies and, and, and uh, dictatorships and and some would question whether we aren't there anyway, but right now. <laughs> Scott, how about you? D uh, D hi, everyone. David. I, have, I have a comment just to kind of follow up on what uh, Carol's question was, and then I have my own question. I, I find it interesting, too, you mentioned how he wheeled and dealed and, and whether he was ethical or not. I always think about Lincoln's political evolution, how early in his career he wrote, either under his own name or anonymously, letters that excoriated people, not just politically, but personally. And based on the effects of those, he changed those tactics after time. And he evolved as a politician in that way. Um, my question, David, is we all know, and you mentioned Henry Clay, Lincoln called Henry Clay his beau ideal of a statesman. Mm -hmm. What other individuals do you feel like were people who really influenced Lincoln's political ideas and beliefs moving forward from a younger man, as even as he continued through his political career? That's a hard one because um, I don't know that he, you know, came out and said much to like the beau ideal of a statesman about anybody else. Um, I, I'm not, uh, no quote comes to mind right away. He clearly was, was um, uh, influenced early on by uh, his first law partner who was in Congress and um, by uh, uh, by, by, well, well, maybe a little later by, by people like Seward, uh, who he did, I think from Seward when they were sharing a stage in Boston. Um, I can't remember the date, but they were sharing a stage in Boston. And I think what actually in 48, when he went, he did he this, this trip, yeah. So, so uh, and, and Seward uh, was a little quicker to pick up on the idea that slavery was the issue. And, and, and Lincoln hadn't quite grabbed that yet. Um, because Lincoln out in Illinois was more of a, a, an economics guy. You know, he was really in the math and he liked economics. He was a bean counter to some extent. Um, and Illinois really didn't have a big slavery issue. Uh, so it's only when he really got in more onto the national stage that somebody like Seward was an influence. Um, there, um, there, there, there are probably, uh, I, I can't name off the top of my head, but there's probably a half a dozen um, Illinois um, uh, Whigs, more, probably more Whigs than others. He also, you know, he had a, a knack for, for uh, meeting presidents. Mm -hmm. So he, he got to tell jokes with, to, uh, was it Martin Van Buren? Van Buren. Yeah. And, and he, he gets to meet some other people on his way to DC. You know, he's, he's, he 
you know, he had a way of, of ingratiating himself, you know, kind of a poor scump character that always seemed to be in the middle of the action. I, I um, always think, I always think too, Lincoln, Doug Wilson did a great job of talking about how when Lincoln spoke, how he always used the negative. I, we shall not. I, I often wonder how, not only how the people influenced him in his political beliefs, but how other people's ideas influenced him against them and how that influenced his political beliefs. Someone like Andrew Jackson, you know, he had certain ideas that he agreed with Jackson, but I think some of Jackson's policies obviously influenced him in a different direction as well. Yeah, I think the main thing he agreed with Andrew Jackson was uh, when Jackson uh, stood up to, um, to South Carolina and said, you can't just ignore federal laws. <laughs> You know, I'll come down there and, and, and whip you myself, you know, so he he, 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 he liked that aspect of Jackson. I, I'm not sure how much else he liked about Jackson, but they were diametrically opposed politically in most things. But um, I think he, uh, you know, Lincoln was one of these people who he listened to a lot of people. He would absorb information from a lot of people and then he would crawl into his own head and he would think it through. And he would come to a uh, kind of a synthesis of what he thought was the right path forward and the right belief. And then, yeah, he, he would stick with that. So in that sense, he was influenced by a lot of people, um, but not so much that he just emulated anybody. Even, even Clay, he, you know, there were, he, he departed from Clay in some ways. Uh, um, but Lincoln was somebody, he, 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 he had said at one point that somebody said that you're, he's a quick thinker. And he goes, um, no, not really. So, so you know, I, I've, I've got like, and you know, the, the, the phrase he used, you know, I've got like a mind of, of steel. It's very hard to etch anything into it. But once it's there, it's there, you know. So he would absorb all this stuff, think it through, come to a conclusion, and be pretty confident that he was right. Um, he would change his mind if, he, if somebody showed him otherwise. And I think he did that uh, with the tactics that um, he employed um, to try to get rid of slavery. And you kind of saw a little bit of everything during the Civil War. You know, he, he, would, he, would, he would ban it in the South with the Emancipation Proclamation. He would try to convince, you know, persuade the, the border states to get rid of slavery um, internally. And he would, he would try to encourage, find ways to encourage individuals to get rid of slavery, um, which was actually very difficult for a lot of individuals because a lot of the states, as much as they talk about individualism, a lot of the slave states would ban slave owners from manumitting their slaves. So you, you're not allowed to do that <laughs> because it would start a precedent and they didn't want that. So um, there were a lot of, you know, I, I think Lincoln is a very complicated person and, and you, can't, uh, you, you can't ignore that when you look at his political career. He did a lot of things where he persuaded people. And um, I think you were right when you first started that he, when Lincoln was first into politics and first in, in his personal life as well, he could be very sarcastic and very biting and, 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 and hurtful. And he realized that um, in part because of the, the almost duel that he, he fought and another case where he insulted um, a, a fellow politician on the stand and, and the guy broke down crying you know it's it's like he, he started to realize oh wait a second that's mm, that's just <laughs> that's just not right and he, and he changed so i'm i'm glad to see that he grew personally uh, hey, talk Dan, about lincoln's uh, significance in the creation of the republican party role we play um that's interesting because he he was a little slow to join the republican party um, it had really started in in the east and in in uh, was it Michigan I think and and in New York and and the eastern in Ohio, where the Republican Party it wasn't known as Republicans initially but it was it was finally it came be, came to be known as Republicans, and they were really the leaders of the National Republican Party. Lincoln hesitated because he was a Whig, and then he wanted to. Um, you know, he wasn't sure the Whigs were gone yet. And the Republican Party, the big thing with the Republican Party that held him back a little bit, he didn't want it to become like the Know Nothing Party. He didn't want it to become an anti-immigration party or anything like that. He wasn't sure where they were going. But more important, most importantly, he wasn't sure that the Republican Party wasn't going to be an abolitionist party. 
And he, he didn't think that that would work. So he waited until it worked, until, until it was clear. And then by that time, the Whigs pretty much ended. But once he got into this last stages of his career, I think he, he had a lot of influence on the Republican Party because there was a lot of different opinions in the Republican Party, especially going into the 1860 election. Um, there were places like Pennsylvania who were the tariff issue was, was, was a big, big issue. But there are places like Missouri um, um, that slavery was a big, big issue. And there were people who were not so big on immigration. And there were, there were people who were very big on homesteading and, and a movement West. All of those things became ancillary issues. And Lincoln wrote a bunch of letters to people telling him, says, let's not get lost in the weeds. Let's not try to be everything to everybody. Let's focus in on our, what we can all agree on, that everybody in all these different regions can agree on, which is we don't want slavery to expand into the, to the territories. So I think he was, very, he was instrumental in helping focus the National Republican Party in those last stages um, when they, they became a viable national, national party. Uh, David? Yeah. Uh, Carol went off, but going back to her her point, um, if you you know this, we all saw the Spielberg movie. I think that illustrates pretty explicitly that Lincoln did that kind of stuff. Those, I mean, Spielberg sort of exaggerated for Hollywood purposes, but those people that work with Seward that they showed in the movie, those were real people. Bill Bow and those guys, they they they. They did employ those guys to persuade people to go for the 13th Amendment. And he did offer these jobs to people. So, you know, it was for a noble cause, but he did do that. And um, your point, I think, Oak, uh, James Oakes has pointed this out. He said Lincoln did not evolve. He was an abolitionist from day one. I think he, is that your point here that you were, you were making back to the movies? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I think uh, you know the the movie, like I said, is is a little overblown, and and I know Connecticut was pretty ticked off that they oh, yeah. that, that they crazy. changed the historical record and said they voted <laughs> yeah. against it. There's a way to know they didn't. Um, but uh, uh, so it's hard to tell from from the movie, like how much did Lincoln really uh, drive the idea of the Thirteenth Amendment, um, and and of course the Thirteenth Amendment was being pushed by others in Congress, so it wasn't. It certainly wasn't just something that he did. There are some people who say that he was just sort of a, you know, riding along for the, you know, coming along for the ride and the Congress was doing a 13th Amendment and he wasn't really pushing it as much as, as like the Spielberg movie. Well, well this, the, that guy, Bill Bow, who James Spader played was a real, based on a real guy. Yeah, he, yeah, there was, he, a, I mean, <laughs> it was a lot of accuracy in a movie, but not entirely accurate. Let's not forget <laughs> Let's not forget that, that, that Lincoln's Illinois background had a lot to do with this, too, because during the Second Constitutional Convention in the summer of 1847, after Lincoln had been elected to Congress, but he hadn't left yet, uh, Illinois went through this big fight over uh, the uh, uh, individual rights and suffrage and that sort of thing. And there was a big fight over the phrase neither slavery nor involuntary servitude shall exist in the state of Illinois. And it was proposed by a man named Curtis from uh, Galesburg, Knox County anyway. And uh, uh, two days after the, the convention uh, dissolves, he died of cholera. But the thing is, uh, they, 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 they fought so much over this phrase, neither slavery nor involuntary servitude shall exist, which was the 13th Amendment, in the Constitutional Convention of 1847, that uh, David Davis, who was there as a conventioner, uh, he lost his temper. He threw a fit. He said, leave it alone. Leave it just where the courts are at. Don't, don't mess with it, because we run the risk of losing the whole Constitution. Uh, if you stir up this matter over slavery. And so Lincoln knew all about that. And then when Lincoln went into the Matson slave case, uh, two, three months later in October of 47, uh, he did not bring up 
the new constitution provision, which was Article 13, Section 16, neither slavery nor involuntary servitude shall exist in this state. And so basically they took the Illinois Article 13, Section 16 to DC with them. And so it had been a hot topic right before Lincoln went to Congress. And then it came up again in the Wilmot Proviso. And so when it came to that in the 13th Amendment, uh, Lincoln was quite comfortable with the whole thing. Yeah, I think uh, the Wilmot Proviso I didn't mention, but that became uh, an important uh, issue when uh, when Lincoln was in Congress and, and after, which, which basically just said that all of these, um, it was supposed to say that all of these new territories that were grabbing from Mexico in the end of the war should all be free from slavery forever. And it was the same phrase, neither slavery nor involuntary servitude shall Yeah, and, and it, it, never got, it never got passed oh, um, yeah. be, because uh, the, the slave states were still part of Congress. It's, a, it's amazing what you can do in Congress when uh, all the people who won't vote for anything are gone. It's sort of like you look yeah. at today and if, think of all of the things that would have been passed in the last year if the Republican Party <laughs> had left the country and not, and, and not blocked um, all of the voting and it was just the Democrats left. I mean, yeah. some of that might not be great. You know, you might not want some of those things passed, but, uh, but there would be a ton of things passed. So that that's part of what uh, when we, before when we were asked about um, you know Lincoln and using uh, his his persuasion ability and and politics, sure. it's and it's I unavoidable. You have to you have to do here. some some horse trading in order to get things done. Sure, Scott, you had something. I just had a comment. I wanted to follow up um, on something John had said. And I, I'd have to go back and look and see what Oakes's exact words were. But I would disagree. Lincoln was not an abolitionist from the start. Lincoln was anti-slavery from the start. You're there, right. I, I wrote a piece I, I, on this at I one time. Spoke. John, let me Stop finish. You. And you, John, well, let me no, finish. You can comment. Right. <laughs> Lincoln, uh, he was anti-slavery from the start. But there was a definite distinction in the mid-19th century between anti-slavery and abolitionist. Mm -hmm. And David, I think you pointed that out, where he said the abolitionist route was different. And he, he did not align himself with the abolitionists. Like McPherson, I think, wrote a definition of abolitionism or abolitionist as someone who is for the immediate end to slavery prior to the Civil War. He had this whole long list. And uh, Manisha Sinha does a wonderful talk called Lincoln and the Abolitionists. I think you can look it up on uh, um, American History TV, I believe, I believe has a, mm -hmm. a recording of it. And she makes that distinction also. Although Lincoln was anti-slavery, he was not necessarily abolitionist. Today, we, we kind of conflate the two terms, but in yeah. the 19th century, they were different things. When, well, yeah. when you think about it, they're the, they both want the same thing. They want the end of slavery. The difference is the tactic. Absolutely. And abolitionists were, you know, we're going to get, we're gonna, we, slavery needs to end and it needs to end now. And our tactics are either going to be to pass a law that, that bans slavery, which is uh, nobody believed was constitutional at the time, or very few people believe was constitutional. So that wouldn't have worked. Um, in fact, Lincoln thought that if they tried to do that, it would, it would poison the well so that you could never get anything passed um, to, to get rid of slavery. And the other aspect was uh, abolitionists would, would you know, demonize uh, slaveholders and, 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 and the slaveholding states. And make them e out to be evil, which you know you could argue, well, they were because they were enslaving other people. But yeah. as a as no, a tactic yeah, to as I a tactic say. to get rid of slavery, that's not the best, that's not the best tactic. And and Lincoln was always much more of a what I'll what I call a resolutionist. It's not so much um it's not so much where you want to go, but how you're going to get there. And he felt that if you if you work with these people, then they could be convinced to do the same things the people in the North did. The states got rid of slavery. They did it on their own. They didn't have a government law come down. They didn't have a lot of people pressuring them and calling them evil and deplorable and everything else. They just, they just felt that it was the right thing to do. Now, the circumstances are very much different in the South, especially the Deep South. And, and you can imagine um, Mississippi, I think it was Mississippi. Mississippi is like 80% African American enslaved people and 20% white people. Can you imagine the white people saying, 
we're going to free everybody. And then we're going to be in this huge minority and mm -hmm. they might treat us like we've been treating them. I can see where that's not going to be much of an incentive to, 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 to start manumitting uh, these, the, these enslaved people. So Lincoln understood that. And he was a, he was a very, and I, this is something I, I really get into in, in, in the book is coming out, but I, Lincoln was a, a mathematical person. He was somebody who thought logically. He was someone that saw the big picture and, and tried to piece out how to get from one place to another. And he just said, that's just, the only way to do it is to get people in the South <laughs> to change the market forces so that that works against it. You work your way down from the North where there are more they're, they're the more likelihood that those people would agree to get rid of slavery because it wasn't as important for them. And then some sort of probably compensation and, and gradualism, he was always big on gradualism to allow them to, um, to the, the white people and black people to um, live out their prior relationship with each other and develop a new relationship with each other. Um, of you, course, you know, during no, the war, no. that it, it, things changed, and it said, "Okay, forget it. That's the end of it." No, I, I misspoke there because uh, you're right. You sometimes conflate it to, and it's totally different. And yeah, he Lincoln, was, he was uh, never an abolitionist. Lincoln, Lincoln was no Garrison, that's for sure, and or people like that. I actually have given a talk on those guys, but uh, but he did work with abolitionists. I mean, Joshua oh, yeah. Gidden, Giddings was a was a huge abolitionist, and he. He and Lincoln shared a boarding house together when they were congressmen in, in Washington, and they got along pretty well. They didn't always agree, but they got, got along pretty well, and they worked together in a lot of ways to try to meet the same goal, even if they had different, uh, different tactics. And I see uh, Bo has uh, mentioned Lovejoy, <laughs> another one who he worked with. He, he worked with a lot of abolitionists, um, but he was always very clear that he was not an ab uh, abolitionist, so. Well, he got Let's see if we can get any he comments from somebody who hasn't spoken with, yet. Huh? Go along with Douglas, you know. <laughs> Anybody I, who hasn't spoken yet like to get a question in? I have a, a few hundred questions, but I'll, uh, <laughs> see if I can't. I've, I've thoroughly enjoyed it. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, I am wondering about, and this doesn't have anything to do with modern times at all, but what did disinformation echo chambers have to do with the cause of the Civil War? Disinformation? Yeah, so everyone had partisan media outlets, and so Lincoln would get attacked and criticized for not saying anything after he was elected, right? He said, well, I've already, he said, I have a written record, and anyone that wants to know what I think can go to the written record. It's all public knowledge. But he was being misconstrued construed constantly in newspapers with things that he didn't even say or stand for. And I'm, I'm wondering, has anyone had a case study on that or looked into that? Of a study, uh, like what if he had spoken out more during that, that interim? Yeah, I, mean, I'm, um, I'm I don't think it would have changed much because uh, they were ignoring him anyway. They, they were, like you said, they were making stuff up. Right. And that's sort of, that's sort of the point, isn't there a, a sort of a, uh, a case to be made that dis that information echo chambers and sort of tribal information systems can help lead a country on the on the road to civil war. It, Remember, the South had a total blackout on uh, anti-slavery information. There was no discussion, no debate, no discussion at all throughout the South. The newspapers weren't allowed to talk about the anti-slavery positions. Uh, so yes, yeah. that, that was a factor. I guess you could look at it um, in a way, not like not unlike today. You have uh, you have uh, like like John said, the North and the South were getting different information um, because it, it, the, all the Northern information was being the the abolitionist information was being blocked as much as they could, um, and uh, but you had people that would the papers, the newspapers, for example. Uh, the Lincoln Douglas debate book, he took his own from his own speeches from Republican friendly newspapers and, and Douglas speeches from Democratic uh, friendly newspapers because they were horrible at 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 misconstruing what they said. They would garble, you know, the 
Douglas papers would garble what Lincoln said, so it was unintelligible. That's how bad they were. And I think people understood that and they, they picked the newspaper that agreed with them. And that's what they do today. The people, yeah. there's so many different sources of information, you can't handle it all. So people pick the information that agrees with them because it's easier that way. But it's interesting that you brought up the Lincoln Douglas book because Lincoln's fairness, he could have picked the worst speeches, but it is sort of a sense of fair play wanted him to have the strongest argument against him. What, so what other qualities that he have as a leader that sets him apart from, because he's a politician, what, what are the other leadership qualities that set him apart from a standard politician? That's my, and I'll shut up after that, sorry. I, well, I mean, you know, there's good politicians and bad politicians, you know, so you, 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 all politicians are not horrible people, you know, some of them are good people and they actually become politicians because they want to help, uh, they want to help society and they want to help the people. And Lincoln was one of those. Um, there certainly were people there who didn't care so much for the people they were representing. They, they represented themselves and their own interests and their interests of their big donors and, and supporters. Um, Lincoln was never like that. He was always very, uh, very self-secure about his views. And I think that is part, uh, partly because of his own, you know, his uh, brain biochemistry, maybe he would listen to a lot of things, like I mentioned, and but he would always crawl into his own brain to think it over. He wouldn't just go with the flow. You know, if 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 the Whig Party was saying, "Yeah, this is the, this is what we're going to say," he would say, "Yeah, but what about those other guys? They say something that makes a little bit more sense. Maybe we need to take that into consideration." He was always one of those that 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 wanted all the data together. Then he would work it through. And then he would come out with what he thought was right. And that's not the case for a lot of politicians. You see that today too. I and mean, it's not hard to find out who the, the politicians are that, that, that stick their finger in the air and say, okay, this is gonna get me reelected or this is gonna get me in, in good with, with, with the guy that I need to be in good with to this week. <laughs> you know, Lincoln- Amanda credits his emotional intelligence. You know, you yeah, yeah. Like, Lincoln, Amanda. Lincoln was like, what is, what is the right way to go? That's why I call him a resolutionist. Um, and and, in, and in, in one way I can, I can relate to that because I've, I, you know, my science career you know, you, you basically just collect all the data and you figure it all out what it means. And then you, you move forward based on what it tells you. And, and um, rather than going into it, like uh, I dealt with a lot of, uh, um, uh, you know, big companies and the big companies, they already had a position about what they, what they wanted to see. And on the opposite side with a, like the big environmental company firms, uh, they already had a position on what they wanted to see. And they saw everything through those lenses. And I always, because I, I was in consulting, so I, I was sort of the middleman, you know, I always had to look at it and see um, what does the information tell us and how do we move forward from that? And I think that's Lincoln. I think he absorbed the information and then tried to figure out what the best path forward was based on reality, not on, you know, his 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 bias. I mean, everybody is biased, but not on not basing it on his political bias. Last comment to Scott. I'll make a quick comment. I wanted to address a couple of things Bo had said because I thought they were interesting too. The the book that Lincoln published with the Lincoln Douglas debates, we look at them as fair. Douglas did not. Lincoln, although he printed his Republican and the Douglas printed the Democratic, Lincoln edited his. In there he edits his own work. Douglas was all upset because he did not have that opportunity to do that. Um, and then secondly, you asked about a study on sort of what Lincoln had, had done or his ideas, why he didn't speak. I would recommend, I have this on my shelf, Lincoln President-Elect by Harold Holzer, talks about <laughs> the secession winner and sort of Le Lincoln's leadership through that area in trying um, to say things without speaking and kind of what he did behind the scenes to work on that. <laughs> Thank you, David. Thank you very much for this great thank presentation. You. I'll remind people that you're going to do it again next week on Lincoln as Commander in Chief. Uh, thank you all for your wonderful questions and observations. Uh, remind you that we do have our regular meeting on Tuesday evening, where Doris King Mike will speak on uh, the uh, Emancipation Memorial and Ar Archer Alexander, the uh, uh, the black man figured in that uh, monument. So uh, right. and.
Some of you I'll see Saturday morning at our uh, study group meeting, finishing up on Lincoln and Native Americans. Uh, so a lot going on. Really appreciate your participation and attendance. And well, until next time. Thank you, David, again. Thank, Thank you, you, Dave. <clears throat>